Thank you, everyone. So um, once again, my name is Philip, uh, Philip Andres Vinas. So I am currently uh, a master's student, uh, particularly master's in computer applications in Medina State University Ligan Institute of Technology in the Philippines. So I was, uh, before I, I came back to the academic part, I was a Python engineer. I specialize in machine learning and data analytics. I work for um, small to uh, mid-level startups um, remotely in the US. So um, that's where I got uh, lucky with an opportunity to work before for a company that worked on LiDAR, which um, I applied to my current masters and which I will share a bit to you so I can share my knowledge. Okay, start. Okay, so give a, uh, according to Grand View Research, so the, the global digital twin market size was estimated at um, 11.13 billion in, in 2022 and is projected to grow at a compound annual growth of CAGR of 37.5% 30, from 2023 to 2030. So uh, digital twin technology is gaining traction owing to its potential to bridge the gap between physical and virtual worlds. So um, imagine if you can take part by, ta by getting started with it in Python. Um, basically, it's, an, uh, it's, uh, it's, beca it's becoming a trend. Uh, it's uh, being a popular um, path as you go um, being a developer, especially that um, there, are very, there are very diverse um, ways that as a developer you can take your career into. So this is um, an introduction of how you can get started with LiDAR. Since that's the opportunity presented to us by Python to make um, things simpler and more versatile. So um, we'll be having these guide questions as we go through our presentation. So first we'll be, um, ask, uh, we'll be evaluating what is uh, LiDAR and what is application and use cases and what is point cloud data and how do you use Python to leverage it to easily master interacting with LiDAR data and making applications out of it. And what are possible but cool data interactions that you can do with it? Okay. So first we need to understand what is LiDAR technology. So LiDAR in short for light uh, detection and ranging by definition is a cutting edge remote sensing technique that harnesses post late laser light to precisely measure distances to the Earth's surface. In essence, LiDAR operates by emitting laser pulses um, that bounces off objects in the physical world and it turns it to the sensor. And the sensor uh, analyzes the distance and timing and then um, of the reflected light and um, stores that as data, uh, as point cloud data, which I'll be discussing later on. So as you can see in the diagram, so that is a drone uh, scanning a whole field um, of a location and then getting that data back uh, to the sensor itself. So some of its, uh, most, uh, most of its applications are um, in forestry, uh, agricultural, GIS, uh, global information system surveys, and mining. So, um, uh, and there's also uh, modern use cases such as autom autonomous vehicles where um, uh, everything is viewed on live. So as you can see, there are lots of applications in LiDAR that um, we can take, um, 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 we can take our development into. So the, the question is the, the integration that comes with it so we can take advantage of Python. So uh, in my experience when I work um, in LiDAR, so uh, MATLAB was mostly used. So that's when I came with the question, how, if I, um, how much if I could do this with Python? So I can do, I go to, I can do things my way and I can integrate it with um, my own skill set being a Python backend developer. So as you can see, there are lots of data, uh, use cases, like for example, in farming, like they're being used like to identify uh, the condition of the plants for forestry, like to identify, let's say, um, the CO2 emissions, the oxygen. So basically um, for like prevent, uh, disaster and prevention stuff. And then there's the general GIS survey for like, um, for just general information um, for the public, uh, especially in, in transportation something like that. So um, my talk will be focusing more on the GIS part, global information system. Um, since uh, for autonomous vehicles, we would need a uh, large amount of data for that. Um, unfortunately, the internet is um, a bit slow. So um, most of this data can be taken by 
this hardware. So mostly drones with, um, with large sensors, um, which can be very expensive, but that's why we have, uh, we, are uh, we, we took some data from, uh, from open source sources. And we also have those um, uh, camera looking uh, tripods. So those are not <laughs> cameras, but they are like, uh, they, um, they are LiDAR sensors that which takes um, um, geographical data uh, on the road. So for autonomous vehicles, so um, these are like, um, it's attached to like the vehicles themselves. So I don't know how it looks like. So going to um, the data collected by this, um, uh, by these uh, LiDAR systems. So they are called point clouds. So point cloud data is a digital representation of our physical world. So reality is tr transformed into virtual 3D landscape by different points altogether. So it, it's a snapshot of environment by the 3D scanning tools. So what you can see here is um, it's a snapshot of uh, pre-Kumamoto earthquake, so in April 16, 2016. So the reason why um, there are only few uh, open source is because like, um, it's almost like a treasure to get this, uh, to, get, um, to get this kind of imaging. So let me, so this is my, this is my own setup. Since I cannot access it, I, I found a way to access it. I just connected to my PC at home. So let me see if it can move. So as you can see there, yeah, it's lagging a bit, yeah. So as you can see there, it's 3D. So it's, uh, this is a point cloud data, how it looks like. So when you enter that data, you will be, show, you will be shown all the points all together. And usually the one that takes the data labels it at the same time, like um, what we call, uh, we call uh, in our place we call it like the pilot taking, uh, or if we have someone to annotate the data um, from the LiDAR that it, it has been taken on. So as you can see, uh, sorry, it's a bit like, as you can see, it's, um, uh, it's a picture, uh, it's a LiDAR representation of a mountain together with some houses below. So I think this is the pre uh, Komamoto one that I shown you earlier. So imagine you could take, uh, you could take this data, let's say um, you would like to prevent some disasters, you would have, you want to, you want to see the geographical of it. So in order to do that, you have to manipulate these points like, uh, like, a, like, like a Python engineer would do, right? So if we can do that in uh, MATLAB in other languages, how much more if we do it in Python, which is our comfortable language? So luckily, there are, uh, there are tools available for us in Python these days. Um, so the, what are the challenges when we are processing cloud data usually? So the data volume. So managing and storing all of this point cloud data set is often millions and billions of points. So it can be time consuming and also um, a, hardware, uh, a regular home setup might not be able to take it all together. So what happens usually uh, um, is that um, this is being subsampled, which I will explain earlier. In order to, in order for that data to be play, uh, to be mani uh, to be manipulated on, so that um, as uh, as developers we are able to um, take that data and then manipulate it in order to get our own uh, what we want to find out on that data, what our research is. Let's say we want to research on trees or we want to research on. Um, on the ground, so basically you can do you can do both as long as, yeah. and data quality, ensuring accuracy and quality through calibration and noise reduction. So um, this is um, this is just to uh, make uh, make your development easier. Uh, data registration, uh, precisely aligning multiple point clouds for simplest integration. So um, uh, it it uh, it is a challenge because it is hard to piece all together, especially for example your. You're using airborne uh, air, airborne lidar uh, sensors. So in order to for you to piece them together, it could be it could be prove a challenge. And as a developer, it is almost out of your reach until you get that data. So um, it's it's either it's up to you if you can find a solution for it or not. So the feature extraction part. So this is where our main role comes in. So we are we are trying to extract this meaningful data, like trees, like structures, buildings from all of this LiDAR data and we try to label them. Um, if they don't have any label, we can annotate them. If we, if we don't have someone to annotate, we can, we can modify that data. So what, uh, we, we, can, we can apply some algorithms so that um, we can show, um, we can have a certain idea on where are the trees, where are the, where are the crowns of the trees. So we can separate all of those and then 
make our own calculation based on it. So how are we tackling these ch uh, challenges? So subsampling, um, uh, as, I, as I explained earlier, so we reduce the memory strain by the computer because um, having home setups, it is difficult to, to work on like billions of data, set, uh, uh, data points. So we only have those uh, representative portions. So just enough, uh, just enough for us to like uh, to take shape of that point cloud data that we have. And then next is noise removal. So um, removal cons uh, noise removal consists of either reduction. So either we reduce our data so that we can uh, we can have a minimum amount of what we need, or we can um, normalize our data so that um, uh, we have um, uh, we have less of what what we can work on. And then block or chunking process. So we break down these data sets into smaller blocks to conserve memory. Uh, let's say the pre Kamomoto data set is like a very large data set. So we want only to take a portion of that. For example, we only want to research about, uh, let's say, uh, the uh, carbon dioxide sequestration of the trees there. So if, one, if, one, if that's what will happen, so we only need the trees, right? So uh, we, we, we put that into a chunking process um, so that it would be, um, it could make, um, it could make uh, it easier for us as developers so we can comfortably uh, develop. So this is where Python comes in. So um, Python's extensive data manipulation libraries like NumPy uh, make natural choice for subsampling. And then Python's rich ecosystem includes powerful um, signal processing libraries such as SciPy, um, which simplifies noise removal. There are also other um, deep learning uh, alternatives that we can use for it. And so using Python can divide large data sets into manageable blocks and chunks, making it versatile choice for handling memory limitations and creating organized workflow. So um, Python in its Philippine, uh, in LIDAR proce uh, data processing, its appeal is in its simplicity, readability, and wealth of libraries that make it a prime choice for newcomers and seasoned developers alike. These libraries empower users to efficiently process LiDAR data from acquisition to analysis and visualization, making Python accessible and versatile tool for its technology. So as you can see in that simple line, um, just in that simple line, uh, was able to, it is able to read, uh, the, uh, it is able to read the last file. So a last file is like a point cloud file. It's one of the simplest form. So uh, in a Python import, uh, it is a sample of it where you where you read it, uh, take the points, and then um, uh, add it to a visualizer. So I will show you uh, how it works later on. So these are um, the, impor uh, the important libraries um, when, you, when you deal with LiDAR in Python. So LastPy, so it's a library for manipulating data in last format. Um, there are other formats that are ideal, but last is the most easiest way to start as a beginner. And then uh, uh, PDAL. So versatile point cloud data processing. So um, for various data manipulation. So it's the same. The uh, it's the same. Like uh, it's a bit similar, but um, for um, for certain use cases. And Open 3D. Um, this is a very robust library for visualization. So and there's also PyLiDAR, which is where you can manipulate data and at the same time visualize. So what we'll be using for today is LastPy and Open 3D. So we can make our, our demo uh, lighter, uh, given that I only have my laptop right now. So um, let's try um, uh, having at least uh, airborne LiDAR data. So we will be going through just three steps, like simple step. We load uh, the point cloud samples, we subsample, uh, we noise reduct, and we chunk. And then we do our LiDAR segmentation so this time, since um, we're going through, uh, we have uh, airborne uh, uh, LiDAR data. So let's say that we want to know like about um, the diameter of the trees. So basically below the crowns are the, uh, the trunks, right? So we want to know the diameter of those. Then let's say we want to apply that to the whole mountain so that we can get a visualization of how it would look like, uh, how thick the trunks of the trees in a wider scale. So first we need to yeah, we need to load our sample. So, hold on. Okay. 
just a small thing. Okay, already have it in place. So I have uh, I, I have three uh, functions here. Um, I already separated into functions for for easy readability. So I have uh, a function to read the last file. Uh, I have um, the function that I want to uh, compute the diameter of the trees. Um, also, um, I have the down sampling fun uh, uh, fun uh, function. So given those functions, um, okay. Ah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, let me see how I can. Uh, let, uh, let me go back. I haven't presented for a while. <laughs> uh, tools windows. Zoom in. 100%. Is that bigger? Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. So, we have the read, uh, again, we have the read last file. So as you can see, I'm using last pi, the read. And then using uh, I'm using NumPy vstack to um, to get um, uh, because um, point cloud data have a, are x y and z axis. So as you can see in my sample, so I see below. So those points are being taken into uh, into NumPy and converted into last points. And then the compute diameter. Uh, it computes the distances, um, depend, I forgot the paper about this, but um, basically computes the distances between um, the, uh, the trunk and the, before the crown, and then based on that, um, categorize it based on the points, uh, the cluster of points uh, in that area. And then we have the sum, uh, down sample, so um, I'm, using, uh, I'm, I'm using a voxel down sample um, from last pi also. So here we have last points. Um, we can easily declare it, and then send our um, uh, send our um, last file, and then point cloud. Uh, we declare we declare our open 3D uh, visualiz visualization, and then once we got that, um, we we take that last points that we read into um, vector 3D vector function in open 3D utility, and then declare the status point as points, and then we visualize it um, using uh, using visualization that draw geometries uh, function. So let's try to run it first and see that part. So it didn't it didn't detect my video card. <laughs> Usually, if it's a, if if you have a G, if you have a good GPU, you can run this faster. So as you can see, this is I already chunked this part uh, because it's like it's heavy. Okay. So these are these trees are part of that large data, data set I've shown you that is running on my local PC that I connected at home. If you enter that, uh, it's just a general like uh, visualization of the trees inside. So even if the even how 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 no, uh, how noisy do you think this data is, um, you, you can you would still be able to see the trunks that you want to target, right? So those are trunks, and there's the ground. Yeah, I think I removed the ground already. So usually, uh, I think I, I'll show you the the one that has the ground earlier. So usually there's the ground there, but I already removed that with uh, another function that I will introduce to you later. So what we want to do is to get the diam uh, to, to categorize the diameter of all of this by taking this small chunk of data, and then take that into uh, take, apply this entire uh, entire um, script into the entire um, Komamoto data set that we have. So um, slow. So I'm going to close this. So this will be done sampled. So in the done sample cloud, so there's a done sample function, and then um, basically it will just take off like the unnecessary points that I need. So the clusters within the clusters. 
So this is the subsampled one. As you can see, I can play with it faster. It's faster because it's easier to move. That way, you would, as, develop, as a developer, you'd be, be able to easily manipulate it also, and then it wouldn't strain much of your computer's memory. You can also inspect things faster. Okay. So after, after we downsample this one, we want, what we want to do is like apply the segmentation that we want. That's the. So in order to apply the segmentation, um, segment, segment. Um, we have um, we have our um, uh, DBH. We have our DBH um, cal calculation. Oh, hold on. So let's start at the first. So um, we have the point cloud. We have the points. We have just done some. We already done sampled it, so we initialize the color. So we the, the color that we saw earlier are the default ones. So it will show us like uh, like a heat map or something. But we want to um, we want to color it like in order in order for these categories. So in order uh, we we, uh, we we count the clusters into a DBH list, and when as we compute the diameter and append it to a list. So um, basically, we get a points of like uh, like points of this uh, point cloud uh, point cloud data that would have the diameter at breast height. Uh, diameter at breast height are like the diameter of the tree. And then we normalize it as uh, because we want to reduce the noise. And then the, we color it according to what we want to color it uh, as the, as it gets like um, from the smaller one. Uh, from the smaller one to the uh, to the um, to the bigger ones, and assign it to the colors of the cloud depending on the um, the downsampled point cloud indicator, and then visualize it with Open 3D. So let's run it this one segment. So it's, run, uh, it's running a bit slower than the usual because it's already doing the segmenting at the same time. So I already chunked that up, so it shouldn't take that much time. Okay, it's processing. Yeah, I should have. So while, while it's processing, let's move to the next slides. I'll show you the output later. So let's, uh, let's, let's try, um, as, as, as we wait for that output, let's try an, another example problem. So let's try a wider scope, but um, smaller amount of um, point cloud. So we initialize the point cloud data, and we segment gr from ground to non-ground. And then we, we segment it, uh, uh, we segment it or classify. Depending on its, uh, uh, depending on the formula that you want to add to it, okay. So it pop up already. So as you can see here, I categorize each tree to be uh, uh, to be red depending on the uh, the intensity of its uh, diameter. So as we go closer, let's see if there are other colors, if there's any outlier. So there are certain stems that are blue. But most of it is red, maybe due to the um, due to the voxel size. Of uh, as you can see, like uh, the points are already uh, normalized and uh, noise is reduced. Otherwise, like this this branch would look like uh, would have much uh, point cloud data inside. So if you applied if you then apply this to a bigger scope of data, you then be able to get um, uh, a more of a, a variety. Uh, and also, as you increase, um, as, I, as I increase the the size of your data, you should be able to get a more diversity on the intensity of the DBH that you want to achieve. Uh, the DBH that you want to achieve. So, as you can see here, we segment ground from land ground and segment and classify. So, this is um, identifying the la uh, the landing points. 
So basically, in order, uh, your use case is to find the landing points like for a helicopter or something like for search and rescue or something. So let's say in a mountain like that, uh, you segment, uh, you take off the ground, and then you segment or classify. So let's try, uh, let's try another, let's try another example. Okay, I only have 10 minutes left, uh, okay. Okay, um, I'll just uh, proceed. Uh, the other example was just taking the ground from the, uh, like the, 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 the visualization that you saw earlier. So uh, how does blocking works? So you have an input file, which is a last, uh, last file in a chunks. So if chunk has data, you go to the pre-processing step, which is um, the normalization, the noise reduction, um, the, what did I forget? Uh, the reduction, uh, because you want your data to be light, lighter as possible. And then you segment it using uh, SciPy. The, I used SciPy earlier um, to, get, uh, to get the DBH formula. So depending on the paper. So let's say that you, uh, in the paper, you saw a paper um, about getting the DBH. You apply it. You cluster it. So you, you use a segmentation formula and use, up, uh, use, a, use SciPy. There are, there are other um, deep learning uh, clustering algorithms available that you can use. So after segmentation, you check if chunk has still, uh, still, still has data. So you run, you run it through the entire, like, uh, entire data set that you have until, uh, until, you have, um, until the chunks doesn't have any more data, you get finished. And then you write, it, uh, you write that vis visualization in, into a new last file so that you can get, uh, uh, you, you then can get your desired result. So challenges and tips. So you need to keep it easy and simple. So ML calculation takes a lot of processing power. Thus the need to do pre-processing techniques. So it's not, uh, you, can, you, you can use like the entire, uh, the entire uh, you can use AI, ML, uh, ML to get the entire um, data set. But given, um, given that you want to uh, do it efficiently, so you want to test out with, with smaller ones, right? So, uh, instead of doing that, you, chunk, uh, you do the pre-processing techniques, so you can uh, you can get your solution faster. So use tools for the right job. Use the right li libraries and algorithms. Sometimes there are even more difficult point cloud data formats to handle, which requires a different set of libraries. There are even times when you have to use other languages like R to make some conversion to your point cloud data. So if possible, uh, if you know other languages, uh, you, you can you cannot limit yourself to Python only because um, there are actually as long as it is a last file, if you process it in R, as long as it's the same, uh, when, you, when, you go, when you process, back, process it back to Python, you can, still, you can still manipulate it the same way. Let's say you just want to add a formula to it or something, or an algorithm. So during segmentation or classification, uh, lots of machine learning cluster and clustering techniques are available. Play and read the parameters until final this, uh, ideal result is achieved. So there's um, a popular one that's called PointNet++. Plus plus. So it's being used in MATLAB mainly, but currently there's, there's already a Python version available. So Python's empowerment, so Python's versa, uh, vers versatility, um, which are vital for unlocking potential of later data. So now if you, are, you can start as a beginner in Python, you don't have to learn MATLAB. Because when I started this, uh, when I started my thesis, I, I, was a, I had to learn MATLAB from the start. So LiDAR significance. So LiDAR technology is transforming industries with highly accurate 3D data. So it's very popular uh, right now. Everything is running, I think. No, not everything, but it's, it's gaining traction over the time. And we want to get as many skill sets as we want. And point cloud complexity. So there are, other, there are lots of libraries available. Uh, real world impact. Um, Real-world case studies showcase Python's practical application in LiDAR, especially in agriculture, uh, let's say in real estate, let's say in mining. So there are, there are indeed lots of application to it. Um, even, yeah, even in cars right now, like. And then, oh yeah, there are even like, you can do it with an iPhone, where you turn, your, turn an ob object into a, a 3D version of it, and then upload it to get a virtual version of it. 
So we gain a deeper understanding of Python role, uh, Python's role in processing complex LiDAR data, offering limitless uh, possi uh, and possibilities in various domains. So I think that's all for my talk. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have a, a little question and answer session. Uh, can anyone have a question? Oh. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation today. Uh, I just wanted to ask, is there anything that exists in the MATLAB ecosystem that still doesn't exist in Python that would make life easier for somebody using LiDAR data? Yeah, to be honest, Lots of pre-built functions exist in MATLAB that in Python you have to, uh, you have to do some data manipulations. Like um, there's some, there's some one-liner built-ins like remove noise, like uh, uh, remove like uh, subsample, where in Python you have to use like NumPy or something. So it's still young, uh, but the community is, there's, uh, there's lots of like libraries already up, up reading. Like recently I found out that point .NET, which is I thought that was only in MATLAB, but I will suddenly available in Python. So, yeah, I think uh, MATLAB, MATLAB has currently still has more capability than Python in LiDAR. <laughs> thank That's you very much. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Question? Okay. Um, we will have to, uh, we will end up uh, Philip Sands talk session here. Thank you very much for your talk. Everybody, please give a big round of applause to the speaker. Thank you, everyone.